Hi, everybody, and welcome back to What on Earth Am I Here For? Did you know that the Bible tells us that God created you for five purposes? And today, we're going to look at the first of God's five purposes for your life. In Revelation 4.11, the Bible says, You, God, created all things, and it is for your pleasure, underline that, for your pleasure, that they exist and were created. Everything was created for the pleasure of God, including you. You were planned for God's pleasure. When you came out of your mother's womb, God was there in the room smiling from ear to ear because he wanted you to be alive. You were made for his pleasure. Now, in our first session, we talked about how you were created to be loved by God, but there's a flip side to that. God wants you to love him back. And there's a word for this. Loving God back is called worship. Worship is expressing our love to God. Now, the problem is that worship is a term that's misunderstood today. When I say the word worship, what do you think of? You probably think of singing or music. You may think of prayer. You may think of rituals or communion or going to church. Now, those are expressions of worship, but worship is far more than those things. Worship, in its essence, is knowing and loving God. And this is your number one purpose in life. Worship is your primary objective, your highest priority, and your first purpose, learning to love God back. Now, the truth is, everybody worships something because you were wired by God for worship. He put it in your DNA. You couldn't stop worshiping if you had to. It's a part of being a human being. That's why you can go to any culture in the world and you'll find people worshiping. If you don't worship God, believe me, you're going to find a substitute very quickly. Because even if it's just worshiping yourself, you were wired for worship. Now, probably the best verse in the Bible that defines true worship, the kind of worship that God wants from you, is Romans 12, verse 1. It says this, Because of God's great mercy to us, offer yourselves as living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Now, I want to point out two things about this verse. First, worship is my response to God's love. You might write that down. Worship is my response to God's love for me. Notice it says, because of God's great mercy. God always makes the first move when it comes to love. He takes the initiative. He creates us. He saves us. He forgives us. He blesses us. He protects us. He does all of these things simply because he loves us. And because of all of these things, we respond to him in worship. We love him back. Second thing I want you to notice is what we do in response. It says we offer ourselves to God. That is what worship is. Worship is giving back to God. God gives to us, and we give back to him. And that brings God great pleasure. Now, the question is this, what am I supposed to offer? What do you give a God who has everything? I mean, he made the world, he made the universe, he made you. So what can you give him in return? Well, in worship, you give God the one thing he doesn't have unless you give it to him. You give him your love. Jesus said the most important commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now in this verse, Jesus teaches us three important lessons about worship. First, worship is expressing my affection to God. That's what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. In other words, God wants you to love him passionately. The most important thing you can know in life is that God loves you. And the most important thing you can do in life is love him back. So, so when you get up in the morning, and when you get out of bed, why don't you sit on the edge of your bed and say a little prayer like this. God, even if I don't get anything else done today, at the end of this day, I want to know you a little bit better and I want to love you a little bit more. Then no matter how bad the day might have gone, no matter how many plans have fallen apart, if at the end of the day, you know God a little bit better and you love him a little bit more, that day was a success because this is the first purpose of your life, worship, learning to love God. On the other hand, even if you knock off everything on your to-do list and you achieve all your goals, and if at the end of the day, you've done everything you wanted to do, if you don't know God a little bit better and you don't love him a little bit more, 
that day was wasted because God did not put you here on earth to simply check, check things off your to-do list. The first reason God put you on earth was to get to know him and to learn to love him back. Have you ever told God that you love him? That might be a difficult thing if you grew up in a family that wasn't very affectionate or very expressive. And if you've never done it before, let me tell you how to get started. Start by just saying, thank you. Thank you, God. Look around you. Everything you have is a gift from God. He's already told you. He loves you a thousand different ways. You just say, God, thank you for a beautiful sky today. God, thank you for green trees. Thank you for clean air. Thank you that I'm still breathing. Thank you that I woke up this morning. Thank you that I had something to eat. Thank you that I'm not freezing to death right now. You could go on and on and on. Just start by being thankful. It's a good way to start expressing your love to God. Now, the fact is this. God has very, very, very deep feelings for you. The Bible says he is a God who is passionate about his relationship with you. Did you know that? Some of you think, well, God's too busy for me. He doesn't care about me. God doesn't even know my name. He doesn't even know I exist. Oh, yes, he does. The Bible says your name is engraved on the palms of his hands. The Bible says he's never taken his eyes off you. The Bible tells us that God is intimately acquainted with every area of your life, and he loves you, and he wants you to learn to love him back. God wants your love to come from your heart. He doesn't want ritual. He doesn't want religion. He's not interested in rules or regulations. He wants a relationship with you. In Hosea chapter 6, God says this, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your love. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. Can you hear the passion in that verse? Circle the, the words know and love in your study guide. This is the first purpose of your life, to know God and to love God. Now, the greatest way to express your love for God is by giving your life to him. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, 13, give yourselves completely to God since you've been given new life. Remember, worship is always a response to God's love. God gave you life and he gives you new life in Jesus. And he says, now I want you to give your life completely back to me. Some of you are thinking, that's my problem. And the problem is, I just don't love God enough. But you know, that's not really your problem. Your problem isn't that you don't love God enough. Your problem is that you don't realize how much God loves you. If you really realized how passionate God is about every detail of your life, you would literally throw yourself at him. How could you not love a God like that who loves every part of your life? You just don't know how much he loves you. Worship is always our response back to God's love for us. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. When you finally understand how much God loves you, that he loved you enough to even come to earth and die on the cross for you, then you say, okay, God, I surrender myself to you. My heart, my soul are in your hands. My life is yours. How could I not love you? That's the greatest way to express your affection to God. Now, the second lesson Jesus teaches us about worship in this great commandment is that work, worship is my focused attention. Worship is focusing my attention on God. That's what it means to love the Lord your God with all your mind. Focusing my attention is loving God with all my mind. God wants you to love him not just passionately. He wants you to love him thoughtfully with your mind. You know, in a lot of religions, the idea of worship is, is this. Put your brain in neutral, kind of lose your mind to the universe, uh, go, go, go empty. Uh, but that's not real worship. The truth is God wants you to worship him thoughtfully, not mindlessly. He doesn't want you to just go through the motions on autopilot, not really thinking about him and not giving him your full attention. God wants your focus. Why? Because he's focused completely on you. The Bible says, you've looked deeply into my heart, Lord, and you know all about me. 
You know when I'm resting or when I'm working. You notice everything I do and everywhere I go. God has focused his attention on you. He never takes his eye off of you. He never stops thinking about you. And he wants to teach you to focus your attention on him. Colossians 3, 2 says this, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. How do you do that? How do you set your mind? How do you set your focus on God? Well, first of all, you can do it by establishing a daily quiet time with God. Now, it doesn't matter if it's the beginning of the day, the middle of the day, or the end of the day. The best time for time alone with God is when you're at your best. You just take a few minutes of, of your day to stop everything else and spend time focused on God. You talk to him. You read his word. You focus your attention on your relationship with him. The Bible says it like this. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. And the focus will shift from you to God. And you will begin to sense his grace. Isn't that beautiful? Matthew 6, 6 in the message. And you know what? You can do this anywhere. You can be in your car as you drive to work. You can be in your backyard. You can be in a corner of your living room. It doesn't really matter. Just find a place where you can be alone with God and focus. I love the fact that God says in this verse, just be there as simply and honestly as you can. In other words, it doesn't require any special ceremony. You don't have to dress up. It doesn't require any fancy words. You don't have to impress God or be super spiritual with uh, fancy theological terms. You just be yourself. Just be honest to God. That's worship. Now, there's a th second thing you can do to focus on God and worshiping him thoughtfully. Develop a constant conversation with him. The Bible tells us in Psalm 105 verse 4, worship him continually. Now, that's not just on Sunday. It means you think about God throughout the day. You carry on a constant conversation with him. You talk to him about anything and everything. You include him in every activity uh, uh, of your day. And, and if you do that, you will be amazed at the peace it brings to your life. You'll be amazed at how aware you will become of his presence with you on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 26, 3, you, Lord, will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed, that means focused, on you. When you fix your thoughts on God, God will fix your thoughts. Let me say that again. When you fix your thoughts on God, God will fix your thoughts. When you focus on yourself, the inevitable result of thoughts uh, on yourself is worry, anxiety, insecurity, guilt, fear, discouragement, all those negative emotions. But when you shift your focus from yourself to God, all of a sudden you begin to sense gratitude and hope and peace and confidence and love. So you worship God with all your heart, that's passionately, by expressing your affection to him. And you worship God with all your mind. That's thoughtfully by focusing your attention on him. But there's a third principle that Jesus teaches us about worshiping God in this verse. Number three, worship is using my abilities for God. Now this may be new to you. It's loving God with all your strength. You love God passionately with your heart and soul. That's your emotions. You love God thoughtfully with your mind. And you love God practically with your strength. You know, it's one thing to say you love God with your words, but God wants you to show your love for him with your actions. He wants you to worship him with your gifts and your abilities in practical ways. Not just say that you love him, but show that you love him. The Bible says it like this. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you are working for the Lord and not for people. Now, if you will get this verse in your life, it will absolutely revolutionize your life. Whatever you do, that means literally anything and everything, work at it with all your heart passionately as though you were working for the Lord and not for people. God is your ultimate boss.
Now, you don't have to join a monastery to worship God more. You don't have to have a quiet time with God five hours a day. You don't have to go to church seven days a week. It's not about that. Worship is more than religious activities. See, so many people compartmentalize their lives. They say, now here's my worship life over here. When I go to church or when I read my Bible or when I pray or when I confess my sins, uh, that's my worship life. Then over here, uh, I, I've got my work life. And over here, I've got my social life. And over here, I've got my family life, my sports life, and all these different things. But God says, no, no, no. I want you to invite me into every area of your life. Don't compartmentalize your life. I want to be involved in all of it. Whatever you do, do it all for the Lord. What am I saying? You don't have to change your job to be a worshiper. You just change who you're working for. You're not working for people. You're working for the Lord. When you change who you're working for, work becomes worship. Wow. And that's the first purpose of life. You see, it's not what you do that matters. It's who you do it for. You give it all to God. And all of your work can be turned into worship, no matter what it is. I don't care if you're a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. You can do it all for God. You may be a carpet cleaner. You may be an attorney. You may be a nurse. You may be an at-home mother raising children. You may be an executive or manager or salesperson or truck driver. It really doesn't matter what you do. It's who you do it for. And you can turn every bit of your work into worship simply by saying, Lord, today I'm going to do this for you. You see, God doesn't want worship just to be a church thing. He wants your worship to be a whole life thing. Notice this verse again, the paraphrase of Romans 12, verse 1. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. That is worship. Now, there's that word again, offering. You might circle that, offering. Offering is the essence of worship. It's the highest form of worship, to offer yourself, your life, to God. Not offering your money, but offering you. Real purpose-driven living doesn't happen in a church. Let's just get that clear right here from the start. It doesn't even happen in your quiet time. A real purpose-driven living happens in the ordinary, routine, mundane things of real life where you say, God, I'm going to do this for you. You can make beds to the glory of God. You can milk a cow to the glory of God. You can clean your garage to the glory of God. And by the way, some of you ought to make a note of that. <laughs> Everything can be turned into an act of worship. Whatever you do, you work at it with all your heart as though you're working for the Lord. When you do that, then your life, your entire life becomes an act of worship. And you begin to fulfill the first purpose of your life. Real worship is not an event. It is a lifestyle. You were planned for God's pleasure. God gets joy in watching you be you. You were created to know and love God. Now, the greatest mistake you can make in life, listen, is to miss your number one primary purpose, to get to know and love God, to worship him with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Jesus said that's the number one thing to do in life. And it all starts when you say yes to God. Yes, God, I want to do everything in my life to bring you honor for your glory. Because of all that you've done for me, I owe my entire life to you. I want to live my life as an act of worship. Now, let me ask you a question. I said a few minutes ago that God wants a relationship with you. Have you started that relationship? H have you said yes to God's offer of eternal life? Now, you may have been church all of your life or maybe never gone to church. It really doesn't matter. I'm talking about relationship, not a religion. Here's what I want you to do. After your discussion time today, I, I want you to go back 
and watch an additional short video. It's only about 10 minutes long that I made called How to Become a Follower of Christ. And if there's anybody in your group who has any doubts and they're saying, I'm not really sure I've stepped across the line. I'm not really sure I'm a child of God. I'm not really sure I'm in the family of God. Then you can take your first step spiritually by beginning a personal friendship with God's son, Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage all of you to watch that additional 10 minute video together uh, after you've had your discussion time uh, in this session. Now let me lead you in a prayer. Let's bow our heads together. Father, what we've talked about today is no minor issue. It's the most important thing in life. Getting to know you and learning to love you. I realize that there are people here at all stages in their spiritual journey who are watching this video. Some are maybe here for the very first time. Uh, but each of us needs to take a next step, no matter where we are in the journey. Now you pray. In your mind, just say something like this. You don't have to say it aloud. Just pray, uh, dear God. Just say that, dear God. I wouldn't even exist if it weren't for you. Forgive me for all the times that I, I think and act like you don't matter. Today I've realized that you made me to love me. And the first purpose of my life is to know and love you back. I'm amazed that you long for a relationship with me. I'm amazed that you're interested in every detail of my life. But most of all, I'm amazed that you would come to earth to die for me. I don't understand all of it, but I want to say yes to you today. Please forgive me for not worshiping you. I want to learn how to focus my attention on you completely throughout my day. I want to turn my work into worship. I want to learn to love you with the love that you deserve, passionately, with all my heart, thoughtfully, with all my mind, practically, with all my strength and abilities. From now on, I'm going to be working for you, doing my job as if you were the boss. If you've never opened up your life to Jesus Christ, why don't you add this sentence? Jesus Christ, thank you for giving your life for me. As much as I know how, I want to give my life back to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me on this session too. Have a good time in your discussion groups and I'll see you next time with session three.